I'm going to call Ethan Crosby up straight away. And let's welcome Ethan as he comes. And let's... Hi, everyone. I would like to announce that the Fed Bank is very thankful for all your donations so far. Next week, we are asking for a jam. While I'm up here, I've also been asked to say that um, the youth is doing a Bible study throughout the week. So if you'd want to join that, either go onto the Instagram or ask one of the leaders about it. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you. Let's thank Ethan. Wow. Okay, so please remember, thank you for all the food bank stuff. Remember Jam for next week. And young people, you have a Bible study this week. Get stuck into it. A few other announcements. Um, one, one, one announcement we have this morning, there is a young lady coming from Kenya to work in Craig Hill um, Community at Glen, Campbell, sorry, Campbell Community at Glen Craig. Her father is a pastor in the church in Kenya. She is called Grace Mariano, and she will get accommodation with her job um, when, when she comes. But unfortunately, that accommodation is not available until the end of April, and she needs put up um, through the month of April. If there's anyone uh, who has a spare room that you can help Grace, her father's a pastor in Kenya. He is linked to Elam through the online Elam Academy. And if anyone could help there, if you could tell us today, um, because Grace is hoping to come on Wednesday or Thursday of this week, and we need to try and find accommodation for her for a month. She will be attending Coastlands Church in her time here. So if you can help with that, if you would come to me today, it would be really, really helpful. Myself or Pastor Alistair or Ann or Alison, it doesn't matter who you come to, but if you can do that, please help us with that. It is Connect Group this week, so whatever night your Connect Group's on this week, please connect in with your group. If you're not already in a Connect Group and would like to get involved in a Connect Group, you can still do that. Talk to Derek or Pastor Alistair. Um, that's how easy it is to do that. Okay. Um, on the 1st of July, where's Leslie? Would I be right in saying the 1st of July? Saturday, 1st of July, we're going to do um, uh, an event for missions. Uh, you may have seen on the church WhatsApp page over the last couple of days, Leslie put on asking for, for clothes donations of clothes. Now, I don't mean all, all the clothes you're throwing out, okay? But if you're thinking of changing your wardrobe from winter to summer, or you have some clothes that you, you're, just, you're just not using, they still have the, 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 the labels on them when you bought them. They're the ones we really want, if we're honest. Um, so if you have anything like that about the house, any clothes, if you could speak to Leslie or Stevie or Jamie or Elaine or Phil, speak to any members of our missions team because what they're going to do is an event on the 1st of July where you pay a fee and you come in, you get tea and coffee and all that, and you can pick a number of items that, that you like. Uh, it's men's clothes as well, isn't it, Leslie? It's children's clothes, anything, any clothes, but... But not, please, not the stuff you're throwing out, okay? Um, really, really good stuff. In fact, you know, if you have a coat on you today and you've got two coats, if you've one at home, you know, I, mean, I don't want to get too biblical on you, but, you know, if you have two coats, you know, you know, but you know what I mean, you know what I mean, if you have two coats, I do actually mean that. Um, so speak to Leslie, Stevie, or any other members of the missions team. But really good to do this. It's raising money for, for missions, for projects, and Cambodia and beyond. So do, do get um, connected in with that as well. Prayer ministry after church every Sunday over in the corner. Anything that you would like prayed for, we will have people up here who can pray for you. Please do avail of, of that part of our time together on a Sunday morning. Easter, Easter Saturday, 10 o'clock, we're going to meet here, we're going to pray, and we're going to walk up the town, and as many Easter eggs as you bring, we're going to give out to, to people who serve in the community, anybody who's serving in the community on Saturday, we, we want to do that, we want to especially go into the likes of Homebird, where we use and, and make sure we have enough eggs for them, so as many as you as can come next Saturday, um, bring eggs with you. We've got little stickers made. Happy Easter from Coastlands Church. It's just as simple as that. Happy Easter from Coastlands Church. We want to bless 
the community who serve uh, in this community. I'm really good if you could help us with that. Next Saturday morning, our big egg giveaway starting here at 10 a.m. Then on Sunday morning at 8.30, we will meet over at Sea Park. We will have communion and a time of witness of the resurrection next Sunday morning, 8.30. And that's what Sea Park is all about, a witness of the resurrection. We'll gather, we'll worship, we'll break bread together, and we'll celebrate the resurrection of Jesus over there. Then here at 9.30, we will have breakfast. Um, more than, you Please come to that as well, if you could put your name uh, on a sheet at the back for that, just so we know how many are coming, coming with regard to catering. Then on Sunday at 11 a.m. rather than 11.30 a.m., we'll have our service, our Easter celebration service upstairs here in church. Then Monday, at 10 a.m., we're in the Scout Centre. Again, there's a sign-up sheet for that at the back. It's five pound for per family. And if you remember, please bring some tray bakes to share. You can have some of them as well, but if you bring tray bakes to share with others, there's always plenty on a big table. Um, we're eating and picking at them all day, so bring as many tray bakes as you like. We will have the fire pit later on in the day, so bring your packed lunch and tend to hang around. The youth are going to be doing some games for us, and we'll have a time around the fire later on in the afternoon. It's going to be a brilliant, brilliant day. Don't miss out on it. It's a time just to be together. It's a time to be together just as church family. So that's 10 a.m. in the Scout Centre. If you're going to be there on Monday morning, make sure you get to the Scout Centre as early as possible because Crawfordsburn Park will begin to queue outside for cars getting in. Now, if you're in the queue and there's somebody stopping cars getting in, say you're going to the Scout Centre, your church has the Scout Centre booked and they will let you in. So even if you have to sit in the queue for a minute or two, you will get in because we have uh, reserved parking at the Scout Centre. All that clear this morning? Yeah. I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot, but we look forward to seeing you. We're going to stay in our seats. We're going to watch a video together as we continue our time together this morning. A week before his resurrection, and just days before his crucifixion, Jesus entered the holy city of Jerusalem. He did not enter that city like a king. There was no chariot, there was no mighty horse. He entered that city on a donkey. Outside the city, the crowds gathered around to see their king, and they laid their palm branches on the dusty road, and they shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna simply means God save us. And that simple prayer echoes across time. 2,000 years ago, the Jerusalem crowds shouted Hosanna to their king on that dusty road. And 2,000 years later, wherever we are, we shout Hosanna, even still. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna in the lowest moments. Hosanna in the green pastures. Hosanna in the darkest valleys. Hosanna in the crowded cities. Hosanna in the open spaces. Hosanna in every church. Hosanna in every home. Hosanna in the victories. Hosanna in the failures. Hosanna in the beautiful beginnings and Hosanna in the bitter endings. Hosanna in the days of trial. Hosanna in the days of plenty. Hosanna in the days of sadness. Hosanna in the days of celebration. Hosanna in the morning and Hosanna in the evening. Hosanna in the sunshine and darkness. Hosanna in the years of waiting. Hosanna in the seasons of blessing. Hosanna all the time. Hosanna everywhere. Hosanna forever. Hosanna to the sun. Hosanna in the highest.
that wasn't a good springboard into the song, I don't know what is, because that's what we're going to do now. We're going to shout Hosanna together. Why don't you stand with us? And let's really declare this today. No matter what the circumstances are, let's shout out his name. God save us. Let's shout Hosanna. Scripture says, doesn't it? The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is within us. Let's just sing that out for a moment. The same power that rolled the stone away. The same power alive in us today. King Jesus, we call upon your name. No other name. Yes, we shall. 
our praise. You're worthy of our praise, Lord. Thank you for your goodness today. Thank you for your love today. Thank you for everything that you are today, oh God. 
Be high and lifted up, Lord. Be exalted, Lord, in our praises. Be exalted, O God, in our thoughts, in our imagination today. Be exalted, O God. Be lifted high. Be lifted high. Lord, we welcome you into every space and every place of our hearts and our lives and our thoughts right now. We say, come, Lord Jesus. May we, may we be a, a hospitable place for you to come and speak into our hearts, speak into our lives, speak into our situations. Father, come, release your word, we pray today. Release your heart today, Father. Let us see you for who you really are. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. Please take a seat. It's really great to see you today. Um, and as we've heard, today is Palm Sunday. And such a great opportunity to have a look at the story of Palm Sunday and unpack it and see what can we learn from that particular story. I don't know whether any of you here today have an if-only story. Um, some of it, some of you might instantly go, oh yeah, well, uh, I would always say, well, if only, you know, if only we hadn't done that, or if only we had have done this or the other thing. I went looking for if only stories, and I came across a guy called Ronald Wayne. Has anybody ever heard of Ronald Wayne? Well, Ronald w Wayne was one of the, s the startups, along with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, to start Apple. And he was an engineer who started Apple with these two guys. And back in 1976, he decided, because he was a little bit unsure whether Apple were going to be successful or not, he sold his 10% share that he had received for the work that he had done. He sold it for $800 in 1976. If he had kept that particular share, today he would be a billionaire. I'm sure he looks back at times and goes, if only, if only. I don't know if you have an if only story. I was trying to think of one for us. And, um, you know, it's probably not a good thing to always live in regret. But I would say one of the things, we used to have a caravan. Anybody a caravaner? Well, we, we bought a caravan and... Um, uh, we, we were uh, trying to do the whole caravan thing. The problem for us was it was right in the middle of whenever we were doing Hillsborough Bible Week. Does anybody remember Hillsborough Bible Week? And so like that were, they were really busy months for us because we were up in Hillsborough Church and it was just nonstop. And so usually we took our holidays straight after Hillsborough Bible Week and you were shattered. And the thought of putting up awnings and you know trying to do all of the active stuff around that, all you wanted to do was go and lie on a lilo. Let's be honest, okay? So we thought, I wonder should we keep the caravan and then my dad and I hope he doesn't watch this but uh, he, he had this bright idea because we were thinking should we sell the caravan, should we keep it, what should we do because we would like a wee Lilo holiday, do you know we'd, we'd love to do something like that and uh, my dad comes up with a bright idea he says, well I thought I was quids in he says you um, sell me the caravan on the cheap and then you'll have a bit of money to go on holiday but then you'll always be able to use the caravan and I was going cha-ching. Anybody else think that's a good deal? So anyway, I was like, hey, are you sure? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Right, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Right, so we got some money, and we had enough money not to go in the summer, but to go in May time to Mallorca. And we thought, right, okay, rather than wait another year and save up, we'll go to Mallorca for a week. Was it the end of May or the start of May? Start of May. And we thought, right, let's do it. The, the girls were um, still a bit young. You know, we must have had to take them out of school for a couple of days. Don't, no, don't, teachers don't shout. Okay, it was back when that was a bit more acceptable. Um, was it ever acceptable? Anyway, right. But um, anyway, we decided what we'd do. We'd have this holiday in Mallorca. We were so looking forward to getting away to the sun, getting a wee bit of sunburn, having a swim in the pool and just relaxing. When we got there, the sun was shining. It was amazing. We got everything together. I'm walking down to the pool in my shorts. Cara's there. And Cara had been, we'd been to Tenerife the week, or the, the year before, week before. We're not that good. The year before. And uh, Cara just jumped into the pool thinking it's going to be the same. And she come up like, oh, it's freezing. Right? Because it obviously hadn't got a chance to warm up. Well, that was all of the sun that we had the whole week was torrential rain, nonstop. In fact, we had to go out and buy jeans and hoodies. It was freezing, all that money. To make matters worse, about two years later, my dad sold the caravan for a profit. 
And I was like, what are you doing? Oh, I'd work to do that, son. I made that caravan what it was. And I'm thinking, you are a gangster. And so I think, if only I hadn't have sold that caravan. I don't know whether you have your own if only stories. Lots of us do. You know, we think, oh, if only I'd done this, or if only. And some of them might be incidental, silly little things like that. But some of them actually, let's be fair, some of us might be living with a lot of if onlys. Or even one big if only. Well, Palm Sunday actually is a bit of an if only story. And the text that we're going to read today is a bit of an if only story. Let's have a look at it together. So Luke, if you have a Bible, whether it's on your phone or you've got um, the paper version or whatever it is, let's open it up to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, and we're going to have a look at verses 28 through to 44. And it's the story of the triumphal entry. It says this, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, well, the Lord needs it. They replied, they, so they brought it to Jesus and threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground and you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Palm Sunday is an if-only story in many, many ways. And there's a number of things that we can lift out of this. First one is this. As I look at the story, I see this if-only. If only they could have seen him for who he really was. If only they could have seen Jesus for who he really was. You see, Palm Sunday, as we well know, it's a day of contrasts. It's a day where some are doing some things and some are doing something else. You see, if some people who see something of who Jesus is and they're, uh, they're, they're celebrating that, but then there's others who are completely blind to who he is. You have those who were following him. They are worshiping him and, and throwing down their cloaks and waving branches and in many ways declaring he's royal, he's someone special. But then you have others who are completely pushing that truth back. You have those who are singing praises. They're singing, as we've heard a lot today, Hosanna in the highest. But then you have others saying, can you stop them from singing? This isn't right, what they're saying. And yet Jesus says, well, if they don't do it, even the rocks will. You have those who are welcoming him. And they're saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I love getting to preach on Palm Sunday because I can speak the only Hebrew really that I know. And it's that Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai. Oh, come on, that deserves a woo. Okay, so that's, that's what that is anyway. Um, I was able to do that whenever I was in Israel and I did it with a tour guide. And she was all, oh, you know Hebrew? I was like, no, just one sentence. Um, but it's, it's this saying, it's, it's this welcoming of, of the one who was to come, the Messiah, the King who was to come. And then you have others who are, they're like welcoming him in, others who are rejecting him. You've won, the one who, 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 who say, here's the Messiah. And yet he rides in on a donkey, not a horse, not a big proper parade. There's humility with this great 
declaration of this is the Messiah, the one we've been waiting for. It's a day of contrasts. And today could be a day of contrast for, for us and the world that we live in. You see, there's people today who are blind to who he is, blind to the fact that he is king, blind to everything that he is. And then there are those who are on the journey trying to discover who he is. Most of us in the room are probably somewhere on that journey, not rejecting, not blind, but trying to discover more of who he is and trying to get some of our head knowledge down into our heart. Isn't that right? Some of the stuff that we can say with our mouths into our lives so that we can, yeah, that's who he really is. There are those who were able to sing praises today, shout Hosanna, and we're like, yeah, you know, yes, you called me out of the grave. But then there's probably some people here today and you find that hard to sing. And you find that difficult to have contrasts. There are some who recognize Jesus as Messiah, but even in the midst of that recognition and God save us, we're identifying with some of what we see in the video of, yeah, God, I, I need you to be Hosanna in this space or this area or that because it's not all just seeming to work out for me right now. It can be a day of contrasts. And the point of this story is this that we would see Jesus for who he is. That we would understand something about who he is. And what are we meant to see? What are we meant to see about who he is? Well, there's a Psalm, Psalm 24. And again, if you have a Bible, go to that. And Psalm 24 is like a foreshadow of what's going on here in this triumphal entry. And it has lots of other meanings behind it, but you can't help but see this being like a, a foreshadowing of what was to come of Jesus making his way into Jerusalem, the King of Kings coming there. And, and I want to read the whole psalm for you today because I'll be referring a bit to it. And it says this, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up a soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? He's the Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? He is the Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. So what are we meant to see in this picture of Jesus on a colt, riding on top of cloaks with people worshiping him towards Jerusalem? We're meant to see this. Who is this King? He is, who is this person? He is the king. He is the Lord of glory. He is the one who's above all things. And this psalm helps us understand a bit more about who he is. The earth is the Lord's and everything within it. He established it and he created it and he reigns above it all. This one who went towards Jerusalem on this unridden cult is actually the creator of all things. He's actually the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the one that's above absolutely everything. This is who we are meant to see him as. He's the creator and the sustainer. He's the almighty one, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the king. He's much more. And this psalm points to, to even more than what they might have seen in that day, that he's much more than just a Messiah or a hoped for one, but he is above everything everything. He is more than we could ever imagine him to be. And there were some on that first Palm Sunday who were starting to realize this. I wonder, do we realize exactly who he is today? Or are we an if only story? Do we recognize exactly who he is? Let me use this declaration that I've used before, but um, I just think it's so good. I would nearly use it every week. And it just says this, God is, and if you think about Jesus, Palm Sunday, this is the declaration of who this man is as he rides towards Jerusalem. It says, God is almighty, omnipotent king, lion of Judah, rock of ages. 
Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Provider, Protector, Ruling Lord and Reigning King of all the universe. He is Father, Helper, Guardian and God. He is the first and the last, the beginning, <clears throat> excuse me, and the end. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He always was, is, and will be, unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and eased pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He is risen and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The world can't understand him. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. The leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. The people couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The New Age can't replace him. And Dawkins can't explain him away. He is light, love, longevity, and Lord. He is goodness, kindness, gentleness, and God. He is holy. He is righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging. He is my redeemer. He is my savior. He is my guide. He is my peace. He is my joy. He is my comfort. He is my Lord and he rules over my life. I serve him because his bond is love. His burden is light. His goal for me is abundant life. I follow him because he is the wisdom of the wise, the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of leaders, the overseer of the overcomers and the sovereign Lord of all that was and is to come. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I feel, he forgives me. When I am weak, he is strong. When I am lost, he is the way. When I am afraid, he is my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I am hurt, he heals me. When I am broken, he mends me. When I am blind, he leads me. When I am hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he is with me. And when I face persecution, he stills me. When I face problems, he comforts me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he carries me home. He is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, and in every way. He is God. He is faithful. I am his and he is mine. My father in heaven is almighty. And so if you're wondering today why some of us feel so secure, understand this. He said it. We believe it. And that settles it. God is in control. This is who he is. And I don't today want to be an if-only story. I don't want today to be someone who doesn't recognize exactly who he is. Because the reality today is I could make all of those comments and still not have got it from here to here. Don't know whether anybody else is like me. And today I don't want to be an if-only story. Today I want to go, God, I see you for who you are. And I give you that space and that place in my life. I think the other part... Another part of the if only story is this. If only they could see how much he cares. In verse 41 of Luke 19 that we read earlier, it just says this really simply. And sometimes we miss this on Palm Sunday. But in the midst of the celebration, in the midst of the Hosanna, in the midst of all of the things that are going on, it says this, as Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it. He wept over it. There's a number of times in scripture that Jesus weeps. In fact, it's the shortest verse. That's always a good Bible quiz question. What's the shortest verse? Well, it's that Jesus wept. And that's found in John 11. And it's really interesting. Jesus wept, John 11. He wept at a time when he knew what he was going to do. John 11 is the story of Lazarus. And Lazarus' friend dying and his sisters, Mary and Martha, being completely crushed by his death. And Jesus seems to be late in coming to help out. And he comes in and he meets this, this moment of desperation in this family. This moment of suffering and difficulty and mourning and, and just utter, we just don't know what to do, Jesus. And it has those simple words as Jesus encounters, encounters the, the difficulty and the suffering. It's just Jesus wept. And I don't know about you, but I've often wondered, why did he weep? Because Jesus knew what he was there to do. 
He knew he was there to raise Lazarus from the dead, and it wasn't crocodile tears. Jesus wasn't somebody that played the game. There was something real about what was going on. And for me, I'm sure everybody's got different ideas around this, but for me, I find this incredible because I know in my life and in your life, I know that God knows what the end of the story is. I know that God knows the end from the beginning and he knows the good things and the bad things and he knows the difficult, and he knows whenever we're going through difficulty, he knows the triumph that'll come out of it. He knows the resurrection story that'll come out of it. He knows the, the miracle story that'll come out of it. He knows the strength that'll come out of it. He knows all of the stuff that'll come out of the story, but it doesn't stop him engaging in the midst of the difficult moment as well. It's not like God is skipping through our lives and we're going through what feels like hell on earth and he's skipping through going, oh, don't, don't, don't worry about it. I've got it sorted later on. I love this about Jesus. He enters in, enters into the moment. Yes, he's God who's sovereign and sees the end from the beginning and knows how he's gonna work it out. But in that moment, he's touched by their hurt and their pain and he, he sits with them in that moment. He doesn't say, what he's crying for? Sure, you should know better. <laughs> he enters into that moment. And for me, I, I don't know, but yeah, that, that does something for me because there are moments where I don't really want the answer. It hurts too much to get the answer just right now. Why well, don't really want somebody to give me lots of advice? Sometimes you just want someone to sit with you and be present. And enter into that moment and be comfort for you. Jesus does that. He cares. He's not so high and removed from life that he's not in the midst of whatever we're walking through and going through right now today. And if you're not going through something today, someday you will. And remember that. That he's there in the midst of those moments. That Jesus wept. He's, he's moved. He's touched. And here again, He's moved and he's touched in this Palm Sunday. In fact, the, the, the language here is that he wept out loud. This wasn't a little tear that just... He, that one of the words that's used in one of the translations uh, in, in the Greek is kaleo. It means to call out. I mean, this was not a private... This was mourning, weeping. His passion and compassion for the city. His longing that... They wouldn't be an if only story, but they're about to be. Because they don't see how much he cares. And they don't see him for who he really is. One of the things that we can do in life is underestimate how much God cares. There's a, a story I came across, and I, I don't know whether you ever get lost in a wee wormhole of reels. Anybody be honest enough to admit that you start flicking through? And uh, so I was flicking through, you know, I, I have to admit, I find the ones funny, you know, where people are falling over themselves and banging their heads and, you know, you're going, oh, ah, oh, right. So in the midst of all of that, this one comes up out of nowhere. And it's a story of a guy telling a story of prayer ministry. And I was, do you know what? You're sort of taking a wee bit. And I was like, oh my goodness. And it really moved me. And, uh, and I know I sh it's, it's dangerous using a rail as an illustration, but this is beautiful. And I've heard of things like this before. So it's not outside of the realms. But it was a guy talking about, and they'd taken a, a bit of a, a snippet of a sermon, a guy talking about time when he was doing prayer ministry, he was praying for people. And this lady came up to him, and she was he like heavy, heavy in emotion looking. And uh, she come, come up to him and she said, I feel, like talk about this, anybody that does prayer ministry, if somebody comes up and says this to you, you'll be like, oh my goodness. Um, and she comes up and she says, I feel like God has said, you're going to give me a word and that word's going to break my depression. Now, talk about feeling a bit of pressure, right? I'm like, whoa. So here's, here's the other thing. So he says, I was like, okay. And the only word that kept coming to my mind was spaghetti. Right? So I'm thinking, okay, where's this going? So this guy's going, spaghetti. And he says, I kept going, Lord, I'm not telling her spaghetti. I'm, I have to tell her a different word. And, 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 and he, but all he can get in his mind is spaghetti. It's like that. Don't think of a red elephant. What animal are you thinking of and what color? It's a red elephant, right? So it's like, and he's, he's, he can't get rid of this word spaghetti. And he says to her, the only word I keep here in my head, and he's, I wouldn't have done it. After. I wouldn't have had the faith, I don't think. And he said, spaghetti. And she just started to cry. And he thought, oh no, I've said something really silly. 
And she turned to her husband and brought her husband up. And he's probably thinking he's about to get a dig in the chin. Do you know? And uh, she says, tell him what you've just said to me. <laughs> and he's like, oh, no. And he says, spaghetti. And the husband starts to cry. And he's like, what on earth have I just said? The story unravels that two years previous, their daughter died in a car accident. And her favorite meal was spaghetti. And the meal that she had just before she went out and had the accident was spaghetti. And it was God saying, I'm in this with you. I see the details and I care. I see the details and I care. And I just wonder today, in all of our lives, whether here today in the room or online, have we underestimated how much God cares and sees and is part of and enters into our lives. Yes, the moments when it's miraculous and everything's working out, but also in the midst of moments where we just don't see what's going on. We underestimated how much he cares. You see, often in the midst of difficulty, we add two to two and we get 12 because we think, well, God, you're so able. You can do miracles. You've stepped in. We've heard the miracle stories. But it hasn't happened. So does that mean either that you're not the same God for me? Or, they, or, or does it mean, and I think this is where most of us go, that you don't care? Now, we don't do it consciously. We don't go, God doesn't care about me. But something develops in here. Something develops in here. And we lose the confidence that he cares. And we lose the confidence that his eye is on us. And we lose the confidence and we just think, I'm just going about my life and my business and doing my thing. Don't miss today that God cares. Don't be an if-only story today. He cares for you. He cares for you. Let me give you the last one. The last if-only. If only they could have opened their hearts to him. If only they could have opened their hearts. You see, Jesus weeping... It's him weeping because he knows he's going to be rejected. And his weeping isn't for himself. It's for what that does in them. His longing is that they would see. He says, oh, Jerusalem, if you would only know what would bring you peace. What would bring them peace? It's him. It's his life and they're about to reject the very one who would bring them peace, who would bring them that shalom, that sense of well-being, the complete fulfillment of what their lives were meant to be. If only you had seen. They were an if-only story. And in fact, he goes on to prophesy, and that's, if you're a bit, in, in eighty seventy, so a, 40 years after Jesus says this, the Romans come in and wreck all of these walls and the temple, and they put it all to the ground. And over 2,000 years later, it still hasn't been properly rebuilt. So what Jesus said has come to pass. But it's, if only you could have seen what would bring you peace. If only you could open your hearts to me, that's what would bring peace into your life. And it echoes then the psalm that we read, lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in, but they had shut the doors, more so the doors of their hearts, that the king of glory had no entrance and therefore peace was never going to be theirs. The consequences of not realizing what brings us peace is so dire for them. Genuinely, guys, really dire for us. Often, and I'm sure you like me, what brings me peace a lot of the times is the scaffolding that I put around my life. That I'm assured of this and I'm assured of that and I've got safety and security and this is going to work and that's going to be okay. But actually what God says is, well, really I'm your shalom because all those things can fall. All those things can be taken. All those things can be removed. All of those walls can be knocked down and left derelict. He is our peace. Long time ago, 
a man sought out the perfect painting or picture that represented peace. I'm sure those of you who are artists in the room are already thinking, I think I've seen a few of those. Well, he couldn't find one. He couldn't find one that satisfied him to say that's what peace looks like. And so he, uh, he was a very rich person and he put out um, a bit of a, a competition and the, the winner would be given lots of money for painting this perfect picture of peace. And uh, lots came in and, you know, they unveiled them and they were, oh, that's not beautiful, they're not beautiful. Until they come to the top two. The second one, the one that came into second place, it was absolutely beautiful. Whenever he did so, a hush fell over the crowd. And what they seen was a, a mirror smooth lake reflecting lacy green birches under the soft blush of the evening sky. Along the grassy shore, a flock of sheep grazed undisturbed. Just this beautiful, tranquil picture of peace. You could get lost in that picture, couldn't you? But then the man, with the vision and the, the idea to create this competition, he uncovered the second painting, the painting that he chose to be the winner. And as they pulled it down, the crowd gasped and they were a little bit confused. Could this really be peace? Because what they saw was a tumultuous waterfall cascaded down a rocky precipice and the crowd could almost feel its cold penetrating spray. There were stormy gray clouds that threatened to explode with lightning, wind and rain. And in the midst of the thundering noises and bitter chill, a spindly little tree clung to the rocks at the edge of the falls. One of its branches reached out in front of the torrential waters as if foolishly seeking to experience its full power. A little bird had built a nest in the elbow of that branch. Content and undisturbed in her stormy surroundings, she rested on her eggs with her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her little ones. She manifested peace that transcends all earthly turmoil. And isn't that the reality? Most of us are seeking the pastures and that beautiful picture. But the reality is, there's a lot of waterfalls. There's a lot of stormy clouds. And true peace that we can discover from God is not found in evading all of those things. It's found when we allow him to wrap around us, when we open our hearts and our lives to him. And so for some of us, we could end up being an if-only story. Some of us, we haven't opened up our hearts at all to him. And maybe we need to do that today. Some of us maybe have, but there's areas that we need to say, God, actually, I've been trying to do that myself. And I don't want to be an if-only story. God, I want to open that area, my heart and my life, to peace. I'm going to finish with this, and while I'm talking this way, the guys are going to come and get into position. Um, so, I wrote a song about 25 years ago, and uh, it came out of a, an if only story. And as I rattled, racked through my brain to think, what could I do at the end of this service that would sort of try and land something or bring it home? This song came to mind. And it came out of a story where I had invited a lot of friends. I was in college, not Bible college at that stage. I was in college tech. And um, I'd invited some people to come along to an event that we were doing in church. And anybody ever remember Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames, right? When we were doing that, I was acting a teenager that actually I was playing a pastor's kid, so it wasn't too hard to play, but a pastor's kid who didn't know Jesus and dragged off to hell. That was quite scary um, and all that. But anyway, I'd invited a few friends to come to Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames, guys who had been doing college with, and um, they were real partiers, like not church people at all. Um, and... Uh, you know, I got them along and they came and I think it scared the wits out of them, but got them thinking about heaven and hell and about life with Jesus. And I remember talking to them after. And we had a good, long, like probably a, an hour's conversation around the things of God. And God was speaking into their hearts. Out of this group of friends, there was two girls in particular. And one 
the tears were just tripping her. God was speaking to her. She knew that she needed to give her heart to Christ. But she fought it like she was, you know, hung on. And it was like that, no, I'm closing the door. And a couple of years passed and, you know, you, you move on, different education things. And, you're, and, and I was on a, in a different space. And I remember just hearing back then about her life and just things had gone pretty wrong. You know, she had pursued other things in life and some dark things had gone on in her life and difficult things. And my heart broke and I went back to that night and I thought of only, you could have opened your heart that night. Things would have been so so very different. And this is the song that came out of that.
It's just wait. But I'll ask you to do something with me. If everyone would close their eyes. And I would ask you to just imagine this for a moment. One of the lines that Pastor Alistair read from our text today was simply this. They came to the place where the road went down from the Mount of Olives. And what that was depicting was the journey down, down the hill, across the valley, to the gate where Jesus would enter Jerusalem. It's called the Eastern Gate. Today, that gate, if you can imagine, in this picture I'm asking you to form in your head, today that gate is all bricked up. And not only that, it has a road in front of it, if you come down from the Mount of Olives nowadays. And then there's a graveyard in front of it, right in front of the gate. And it's almost like a, a picture that there are things in front of us before we get to the gate of Jesus. And I call it the gate of Jesus today. I had a dream this week dream that I couldn't shake and it was about a gate and all I could think of calling this gate was the king's gate and I was looking all over scripture for the king's gate and the only thing that I can think of is this morning as we as Pastor Ali preached as he sang as the team of us is to sing about making room and maybe for someone in the room this morning you would love to enter the king's gate because all of the peace and all of the knowing and all of the realizing if only I'd realized how much he loved me if only I realized who he really is and all those if only's may be answered through the king's gate but for you, there's bricks. For you, there's a road in the way. Or for you, there's just this graveyard in the way. And I would love you to take a step today. Not towards the gate, but a step through the gate. That realizing this Palm Sunday, who he really is the Son of God, who cares so much, who gives us the next chance, who cares more than we will ever know, who comes in the midst of our circumstances and our situations. I ask you today to look at that gate and determine that you will go through that gate today. For you, that may be a gate of salvation. It may be the day you go through the gate of salvation where you receive Jesus as your savior for the first time. That gate may be a gate that you're coming back to today. Because maybe you've come back out through that gate. And to some degree, you've wandered away from that salvation of Christ. Today's the day for you to go back through that gate into the city where the one who loves you can soften that if only. And maybe for you, it's just the bricks and the road. You're just being blocked from the life with a situation, with a circumstance. But today is the day for you to go through the King's Gate. The King's Gate to freedom in knowing who he really is. The King's Gate to knowing how much he really cares about your immediate circumstance. How much he really cares about how you really feel. 
Today's the day of the King's Gate, the gate that Jesus went through for our salvation, for our freedom. I would love to pray for you. If you're standing near that gate today, or you're going through that gate, I want to just lift your hand right now where you are, and I'll pray for you. Don't be afraid. Just put your hand up and put it down. Father, yeah, thank you. Just put your hand up just for a moment, just so that I can pray, just knowingly, where our prayers are up targeted today. Father, break down the walls. Break down the walls. I pray in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for strength today. I pray for strength for people to go through that gate, to go through the King's Gate. I pray, Father, for strength for people to lift up their heads and see the one who loves them so, so much, the one who cares so, so much about their immediate circumstances. Father, I pray that you would give people courage today. I pray that gate would no longer keep us out or keep us in. That we would no longer have a gate that kept you out, Father, or kept other things in our lives. But Father, that it would be the King's gate that we would go through today. Thank you for people going through that gate today. Thank you for people coming to salvation today in this room or online. Thank you, Father, for people coming to freedom today. And we pray, Father, that throughout this Palm Sunday of celebration, Father, we would keep moving towards the King's Gate for all of the beauty that is on the other side of that gate. Make way. Father, in our hearts, Holy Spirit, help us to make way for the King of Glory. In His gate today, we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen, Amen. May God bless you today. May you keep just moving through that gate today. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you sometime in the week and next Sunday. But before that, let's have time to gather around tea, coffee and a, a donut if you're quick enough to get them. So God bless you. God bless you and have a great week.